So now I guess it's time for us to move on to our feature readers, hey? The Aboni Valley Words on Fire Regional Spotlight tonight features Linda K. Thompson, who has one published chapbook for small people in sturdy shoes and a new, not yet published poetry manuscript, Black Bears in the Carrot Field. She is working on the full length manuscript about murder, mayhem, and misguided matrimony. <laughs> Linda was scheduled to be a feature reader earlier this year, but guess which global pandemic decided to change everybody's plans? Well, we have her here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Linda K. Thompson. Woo! Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Hello, everyone. Hello. Here we are, reading <laughs> ah, yeah. some fire. Zoom. Okay, I'm gonna start with one Janet suggested, <laughs> daylight savings. Um, my sister and I grew up on a farm in Pemberton, Pemberton Valley, and everybody, almost everyone we knew were farmers, but we were surrounded on all sides by forests, which weren't really called forest, it was the bush. And we knew a lot of people that were loggers too. And it was a very dangerous job. I wrote this poem to remember the young men who died. Daylight savings for Eddie, who rolled his skitter on the hurley, April 68. Come to me driving that powder blue hard top, faded, almost white, with rusty wheel wells and a tailpipe that wax on the pavement as you round the corner on Pioneer Street. Wear your desert boots with wool socks and brand new red straps. Bring me a piece of crazy lace from your mother's lapidary work. Come with family albums taped full of handsome relatives and your own baby pictures. Everyone turning jaundiced behind their plastic pages. Come with a box of jerky Come with a bag of jerky and a box of old staff. Bring a green plaid tin filled with Elsie's chocolate clusters. Come with your grown out crew cut and the clippers that neighbor Joe traded you back in 65 for 20 free haircuts. Wear a touch of aqua belva. Bring your worn out harmony in its battered case, and who knows how many words we might remember to salute John B. and Bobby McGee. Come in the middle of June with wild roses tucked in your pockets. We'll drive out 99 to the park and sit on a picnic bench in the long pale twilight. Bring an eight track player and speakers that take up the whole rear window. We'll crank up Spirit in the Sky and let the fuzz box vibrations ripple along the weedy shore of One Mile Lake until the sticklebacks shiver under the wharf. Thank you. This number two is called Kirk and it was written about our friend Kirk who he was a kind of a hippie and he lived in his VW van when he had to. And he finally decided one day he couldn't make it in the West, so he went back to Saskatchewan. Kirk. In Aylesbury, Saskatchewan, you can buy a house on Visa. So Kirk maxed his card and moved out last year. He bought one house and then another. He uses number two for his BC bud crop. He's thinking of picking up the hotel next spring. It's just a faded two-story with a retro neon sign out front. Way out the highway, you can see the letters flashing. Hot, hot, hot. The bar is down a couple steps and dark like a basement. Every wall is filled with shells of knickknacks, all elephants. When tourists wander in from the highway, it takes a minute or two for their eyes to adjust. Kirk says he has no plans to clear the place out once he makes the deal. Says he rode an elephant or two in Bangladesh and he tips the chair and rests his feet on his own porch railing. Uh, 
Okay, this, this is the first in a group of poems about a little family that apparently have been, had been living in my head. Um, Ardeth is the youngest girl, and most of these poems are written from her point of view. And the first one is called Everybody Having Troubles. <clears throat> Everybody Having Troubles. After we missed the National Goat Festival in October, Daddy said, sure as shooting, he would make it up to us just as soon as he was sprung from the clink. But Mom was choked by then. The twins twisting her spleen with their drinking and scrapping, and Tiffany sloppy in love with Boober down at the Texaco. And so when we come over the mountain with Uncle R for the Sunday visit, she said to Daddy, she's at the end of some rope, raising up his kids all alone like a widow, with nothing coming in but a dribble of coin, coin from the hauling Granddad was able to get. And that measly check come from the feds on account of the failure of last year's spuds, them all eat up by the wire worm. And the blasted cow broke through to the helmers and the turkey chicks demising like flies. And it made no lick of difference whether daddy thought the charge was trumped or no. The bars were steel and he were on the wrong side wearing pillow tick pajamas. And no way was I piping up to let daddy know how nice Mr. Carlisle down at the Fat Bird Grocer had come driving around with two bags of store-bought food and a box of Napoleon ice cream and how him and Ma had sat on the step and conversed on days past and his poor wife Ida, her dead of electrocution-like. That is Ardeth. This is uh, another one about Ardeth. She is showing a visitor around. And this is what she thinks is what a visitor would want to see. Ardeth shows the visitor a good time. Follow down this way, under the fence. Here's the pond. We skirt the edge. See how it's thick green on top? We were out here last week, checking for dryness of the Moses grass, which can be rolled into a tidy smoke if you had the forethought to steal matches and daddy's rolly papers from under the radio. And if you're feeling raccoon lucky, a ginger beer from the back porch pie cooler goes down swell. That's what Bangler was feeling last week, had himself two genuine brewskis in the shade of that willow. See how it's rubbed and gnawed, all raw by the Gibson's pigs and the roots of poke. See the slick cutway down to the water. That's where Bangler went head first, like his pockets were stuffed with ball peen hammers, down like an otter with a lard greased belly. Hasn't risen up yet. We could set a while. And Mr. Carlisle, I mentioned him. He brought the groceries around. And Ardeth has written a little thing about him too. Mr. Carlisle. First come the billow of dust, then a waft of expired aftershave. And then it's Mr. Carlisle plowing up the drive with a couple bags of store bots and a box of ice cream. Kenny, our hound, nostrils filled to the brim, works up a mournful yodel. Now, Ma is dead set against frilly food, but the Chester Carlisle, bringing it from his fat bird grocer, seems to please her no end. He clambers out of that low-slung, dusty red Oldsmobile, jaunts up the back step, and knocking at the door, all like a man half his age which I say still makes him a walloping overdue senior citizen. In my opinion, for which no one gives a bunny ear, he is an irritatingly cheerful man, always with the you betchas, the dag namets, the howdy duties. Never did such an ancient man utter more exclamation marks. 
His fresh dyed hair is thin as cobweb, rigid with wet comb marks, scraped careful like a surveyed grid from forehead to nape. Tiffany says she spied him down at the Cut to the Chase beauty salon after hours, and Margie Dempster, two buttons open, fussing over him like a hen with chicks. Tiffany is certain it's crowning glory brunette number two, and our Tiffany, who Ma says will wake one morning with her hair on the pillow beside her, she would know. But Ma, she don't notice hair nor nothing, just keeps smiling and nodding and a patent sweat from the hollow of her neck with her blue embroidered hanky. Seems as pleased as if it's the Lord Jesus himself with his long dusty toes come down for a spot of tea and a bite of Grandma Larkin's no egg spicy boiled raisin cake. Thank you. Thank you for your thunderous applause, which I'm sure it is. Okay, so the next three poems are, um, well, they include a Swedish scientist, some Russian brush makers, and Yuri the Trapper. Um, this one, Anguilla, Anguilla, a few years ago, we were on a longboat in the canals of England. And as we were coming back in the pitch black along the path, we met a fellow who was setting up his tent for a night of eel fishing. And we said, but what do you do with the eels? And he said, we throw them back in in the morning. So it just fascinated me and I've been thinking about them all this time. Um, I have a friend, Liz McNally, who even keeps her eyes peeled for, eel news and just a couple days ago she sent me a link to um, a little video that said um, <clears throat> it was a study that reported eels have never yet been observed mating nor have scientists yet discovered the exact location of male eel testicles well i think my scientist is ahead of all those ones she's on a boat following an eel to the sargasso. Anguilla, Anguilla. A Portuguese research vessel southwest of the Canaries follows the faint hypnotic pinging of A3486, a captive bred European eel, released earlier a hundred miles off the continental shelf. Against the blistered wheelhouse, the ichthyologist appears reed-like, ghost-like, thin Swedish hair whipping sternward, snapping at her neck and long cheeks, translucent fingers gripping the rust-rotted gunwale, once painted paradisio blue. Her terror of the sea seems steadfast, but on night 21, the tall woman feels a soothing as the mechanical, as the methodical knocking of the engines enters her marrow and the sway and slope of the mid-ocean swells like her mother's voice begins to comfort. Somni, somni, leak and flika. And she dreams then of bacalao bubbling in tomato sauce and the silver eel beneath the ship her long burnished body swimming on and on. Perhaps as she sleeps, the woman mourns for A3486, her lack of memory for briny estuaries, grassy shallows, bird song through water. Perhaps she imagines her own body preparing for such a journey through dark seas, pale eyes enlarging, limbs elongating, milky skin toughening to a tarnished silver. Johan, her colleague from Uppsala Laboratory, enters the dream and whispers against her neck, you must see to the mass spectrometer. She replies, no, Johan, 
I am longing only for my aromatic foam bath. Elva will be dead soon. Yes, she is dreaming of transmutation, undulation, undulation, the sargasso. Thank you. This is a poem that I wrote um, when I was thinking very hard one night about my Kalinsky Sable watercolor brush, which I bought many years ago when I went to North Island College and took painting. <clears throat> so it's, um, it's in Russia. Low sun, winter sky. Small-handed women in Kabravosk sit on stools under square pane south-facing windows, narrow backs bent, pluck hairs from the tails of Kalinsky sable. The scent of ungulant hooves that boil in a dented pot, an odor they have not remarked for years, the hissing of the burner they do not hear. They build the brush, one hair at a time, from the inside out place them into a perfect round. Anchor each hair deep on the ferrule, crimp with the tool that has always been anchored at the end of the bench. The handle balanced, painted red as a taiga berry. When her brush is complete, each woman places it, belly, toe, and heel, into her mouth, wraps and wets the brush in the curl of her tongue. Pulls it from her mouth through lips. She holds in the shape of a perfect O. Low sun, winter sky. This is the poem that I, I had the title. No, I'm sorry, How Yuri Left Me. I had the title of this poem in my head for a long time. I don't know if it was years but I had no poem to go with it. I wrote it at Honeymoon Bay, um, and I want to thank Dorothy Mahoney for helping me late one night. How Yuri Left Me. Took his long hooked nose, left his share of winter air. Took his hands, left the blue bladed ax, the wood, the ice took the rhythm that rang like a bell through birch, took his shoulders, blade thin, freckled, left a quarter moose, sack of turnip, beaver hides, took his thighs long and lean, his perfect feet that once walked him from Karsk to Utna on a moonlit night on river ice. <clears throat> um, this is for Janet. I know she likes it. It's a little bit more upbeat. Um, men, please don't worry. It's all made up, okay? It's called Shoulds for the Happy Bride. I see you laughing, uh, Libby. <laughs> Shoulds for the Happy Bride. <laughs> These ancient teachings were recently brought to my attention by my dear friend, Miss Bonnie G. Smedley, Regional Librarian at the Lower Chipping Sodbury Branch. Bonnie has worked Tuesdays to Saturdays since 1963, takes no lunch or tea breaks, and works tirelessly for the enlightenment of women the world over. A bride, virgin or otherwise, should place three feathers from a, barn, from a barn owl's underbelly beneath her mattress in hopes of inducing a pH neutral state in a fragile uterus. A bride should soak her entire body in a mixture of three parts domestic goat's milk to one part spring water for specific reasons that have been lost. A bride should begin to collect mice ears several weeks before the wedding to be dried, brushed, dabbed with lavender oil, and tied in bunches of three or four, 
These little bundles will make excellent earplugs. If no mice can be found, a couple rock rabbit ear tips make a fine substitute. A bride should keep a tincture of hemlock close at hand, which, if need be, can be added by a simple shake of the wrist to eggs, porridge, strong coffee, hand squeezed orange juice. Note, above measures should be used only in dire circumstances, but have proved splendidly undetectable when compared with more fundamental instruments. A bride should have an escape plan well rehearsed, an idling car out back, a tractor with a response of high gear, and if all else fail, be prepared to hightail it out of there using Shank's mare. On the other hand, a bride should look on the sunny side and seek to ignore feelings of claustrophobic foreboding. These may be passing emotions and gradually over several decades may dissipate almost entirely. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna end with a poem that's called Saying Goodbye. It's a, friend, uh, it's a poem to my friend who died and you can see in the poem how you sometimes have to work your way through a poem to what really matters and what you really want to say. <clears throat> Saying goodbye. On August nights, we used to hear the E and N pulling along the bottom of the hill behind drink water. And that low ragged note rolled up across the brown pastures that once held your father's charlet. My family back on the mainland are sleeping tight beside tall rocks, dreaming about black bears in the carrot field and the Eiffel Tower that has appeared in the middle of the barnyard. Because they are good farmers, even asleep they worry. How will they coax the bears from the field, save the carrots, manage the upkeep on the tower, cut fields of timothy and alfalfa, wait for morning. How will I ever be at home here, afloat on this raucous beefsteak of an island, threatening to tip into the Salish Sea or slip westward under the plate of Wanda Fuca, forever gnashing away under our beds? On a Thursday in the north, my friend died. So far away, even a crow would not choose to make that journey alone across the great Icha and Cadwallader ranges, up where the lay of the land slopes down to the Fraser Plateau and Mustangs run through Aspen. For the children, graceful, blue-eyed, sorrow drops bone deep. Come to the window. Northern lights are leaping into the whole night sky, wavering sheets of madness dimming even the great W of Cassiopeia. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Hi, Kate. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. That was great, Linda. Great. Love. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Linda. Beautiful Thank work, you. Linda. Thank you, Linda. I really liked it. And Linda. Enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. One from uh, the iPhone said thank you too. I don't know who that is. <laughs> so it's time for Linda's question and answer period if she wants one. Anybody have questions for Linda? Chapman does. Thank you. I do. Okay. I, I love. I love your, um, see, I love little mythical fictional towns with colorful people. And I, I just loved that your small town poem, uh, the, the small town piece. Um, is, it, is it creative nonfiction or is it fiction? That's my question. Which piece is it? Uh, the one uh, with the, the bunny ear, the, the nobody gives a bunny ear. 
and Tiffany. Oh, oh, no, 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 completely. I don't even know where it is. <laughs> <laughs> Not my hometown. All right. It's Port, well, say it's Port Alberni. <laughs> could totally be Port Alberni, right? Okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you. It's wonderful. Nobody gives a funny zero. <laughs> no. I have a question, Linda. Yes. Do you have a poetry collection available? Um, well, I have a small chapbook that I did a couple years ago. And I'm very pl uh, happy to tell you that uh, Mother Tongue is going to publish uh, my book in the spring. Yay. It's going to be called, from that poem, Black Bears in the Carrot Field. Oh, great. Congratulations. Yeah. I'll oh. get you a book as soon as it's won't even wait for it to cool off. <laughs> Thank you. I like the one from about Saskatchewan. Was that actually a real story? That was a real story. <laughs> yes. I thought so. so. Sounds like something would come from Saskatchewan. And... Yeah, that was true. Even the elephants in the bar. And no, the I like to buy a house on a Visa card. Yeah, he did. Yes. Yeah. That was all true. This world. Yeah. That's great. Any other questions? No. You got a oh. you got a comment from Derek Hanabury that said, Wow, that last poem was a mind blower, Linda. <laughs> oh, are you all right, Derek? <laughs> <laughs> could you hear us laughing at your funny ones? Could you no. could you see us I'm laughing? Did you feel <clears throat> Well, I can only see like one, two, three, four, five, six people up here. Oh, they had to throw it on gallery view. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. But then I can't see myself, can I? <laughs> you, sh you should be able to, yes. Okay. Anyway, I'm still in a state of shell shock, Linda, after that last one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Derek. <laughs> so good. Thank you. They were all so good, but that one especially. Thank you. Thank you. And you might have to go, there's one, there's two pages. Pardon? I wish I would have had that handbook for brides 49 yeah. years ago. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been out in 10. Never too late, Libby. <laughs> <laughs> Never too late. Hey, Linda, I also wanted to mention you, you uh, contributed, did you not, to a anthology recently of short stories? Do I have it right? Well, yeah, we did. Janet and I did. It was oh, called, okay. uh, it was by Apple Beard Editions. Okay. Uh, release all the words stuck inside. Okay. It's a good little, uh, it's a good little anthology. It's all prose or very, very short stories. Nice. Um, great comment there, Jackie. 